Welcome to Aon Presents Lynn Juggernauts. My name is Jennifer Nakai. I'm the founder of Aon Counseling and Consulting. And today I have some fun people for you to meet. Um, the mission of this show is to prioritize and, uh, and amplify specific people in our community, especially those impacted by racism, homophobia, transphobia, police brutality, and other forms of injustice or trauma. Uh, I am happy to say that today we have a friend of mine from a very long time ago. In fact, one of my, my first Massachusetts friends ever, ever, when I got here. Um, her name is Jessica, and she grew up in Lynn, and she was the way that I learned about Lynn. My career ended up getting to Lynn and being established in Lynn and spending time in Lynn, but she was really the first person to even mention the word Lynn to me. And I met her in college, in my undergrad, the first year. And from really teaching me the ropes in Boston to explaining to me geographically how the space works, uh, it was her. And so welcome, Jessica. Hey, Jen. I'm um, so excited to be here. Yes. She is a juggernaut because she is an incredible educator, activist, and friend. Um, I want you to hear a little bit more about what she's been up to. She, I know, had an incredible company a few years ago. I know before, before you moved, you were doing a lot of the tutoring, which is an incredible idea. And I don't know why we're not doing more of this. And I, I admire you so much for everything that you do. Tell me more, please, about how you're doing. Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm doing well. I had been a public school teacher in Massachusetts and um, me and my now husband decided we wanted to move to California um, just to try something new and definitely get away from those, those winters, I'll, I'll admit. Um, and so we moved to California. I didn't find a teaching job right away, so I fell into tutoring, like Jen said, here in California. Um, and I fell in love with working with students in that capacity. And um, then I started teaching at a small private school that focuses on individual students and working with students as a whole person. And I really fell in love with their mission. And I've um, worked there for over five years and now I'm their academic director. Um, and I still teach because I love that, but I also help teachers be their best selves and work with families to, to help them. Thank you so much for what you do. Um, I have always been very impressed with all of your moves. You're a mathematician. You are one of the smartest, most logical people I know. And also, you, your background is where I work now, and how amazing is that? But tell me a little bit more about your experiences uh, growing up in Lynn, because I know we were talking about it the other day, and there were things that really propelled you and helped you uh, stand out. Yeah, so I knew in kindergarten that I wanted to be a math teacher, which is funny, that kindergarten yearbook, What Do You Want to Be? Kids had firefighter or rock star, I had math teacher. Um, my, my reasons for wanting to be a math teacher changed over the years, but at first it's just because I loved math and that's what I understood that people who love math did. Um, I, I definitely, you know, I have a gift in, in math, not one of those super geniuses, but I do understand it um, the way some people don't. And in growing up, I found myself helping people in my classes or after class, like understand math. And so I knew that that was definitely a need and that that's where I fell in love with it as well. Um, I, I had a good time. My, my Lynn education was, was pretty, was pretty strong. I know people think about a city like Lynn and they assume that we don't have a strong education. And I know it's not the, the best for everyone. That's true about any education system, but I, I won't try to pretend like I really under, remember elementary school, but I know that, you know, that was a pretty good education. And I went into middle school, um, as a strong, a strong, um, student. Um, that's when my home life started to be a little bit, a bit crazy. So I know that I was not at my best, but I still had my, my skills in math to kind of help me out and, and teachers and guidance counselors to, to help me, um, keep trying and, you know, keep on there. I know that, like I said, I, I started to really be that, I don't know, 
moody teenager in, in middle school and um, maybe doing some risky behaviors throughout middle school and high school, but my teachers had my back and guidance counselors had my back and um, where they fell short, I found in the community. And I think communities and clubs can really be a, a big thing. And I, I am a math person, so I was always in math club or math team and we competed and that was amazing. But I also fell in love with theater and that's how me and Jen met actually in theater classes. So when I got to college, I double majored in math and theater never really wanted to pursue theater as a career. I just loved it and wanted that to be part of my life. Um, but theater programs at Lynn English, you know, was a huge thing for me at um, the YMCA. The Lynn YMCA was a huge home for me. I ended up working there a lot. We had a theater program, which was really like a teen center as well. Um, and that helped me find my tribe of people, you know, that understood me. I didn't always feel like I had that in school. And so I found that tribe there. I was also an ROTC in high school, which I think helped me a lot. Um, I did that because I want, I knew I wanted to be a teacher and I knew I was really shy and you can't be a teacher if you can't talk in front of people. So ROTC helped me. Um, shout out to Sergeant Major Oswald on that. He's um, an amazing human being. I think he's retired now, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, yeah, it's, you know, there's a lot that, that could have knocked me down, but I, but I also had a lot of supports to keep me going. And um, yeah, that's where I'm at today. Beautifully articulated. Uh, one of the questions or the only question really that I had for you today, and thank you for sharing all of that, um, is, is how do we address then the children now? And I'm gonna provide some context to, you know, why I wanna ask this to you specifically and and why it's important that we talk about this right now. There's been a couple of new trends in the community right now. And one of them has been to call children, uh, especially children who have been active in protests or active in the community and have been outspoken about politics and are trying to do their part. Because I think they also feel responsible are being called terrorists and stupid. Um, I have a problem with that <laughs> because that doesn't make sense to me. I think that we have a lot of leaders who are even saying things like, well, our next generation, can you imagine voting for the people who listen to things like hip hop and reggaeton? And it's like, well, wouldn't have somebody said that about you with rock and roll, would you say, or, or anything like that? It's just like, this is kind of like history repeating itself and everything is copy, like Nora Ephron says. And I wish that we could learn from one of these copies and maybe not make the same exact mistakes <laughs> and make it easier for each other. Like you said, there's going to be obstacles, but we try to be those role models and those people who kids can turn to and say, you know, am I, am I doing things okay? Am I going to be okay? Why are people talking about me? Um, and so... How, how would you address the kids at this time? What, what are some recommendations, do you think, especially knowing the environment? Yeah, um, I'm, so, I'm so discouraged to hear talk like that, and I'm glad that, um, you know, you keep me grounded in Lynn. I am here in California, um, and I don't have too much family in Lynn anymore. Um, it, it re just reminds me of, you know, we've, we as people from Lane, you know, have, have always been looked down upon by our, you know, obviously not by everyone. It's not a sweeping statement, but, you know, people in surrounding neighborhoods. I, I remember this, this shows off my nerddom, but I, I wear it with pride. I was, I was in math team in middle school and we hosted one of the competitions in the surrounding um, cities. You know, one of the kids walked up to us and said, oh, you know, what school are you from? And we said, oh, this is our school right here. Oh, you're from Lynn and turned away and walked away. And that was middle school, right? That was gosh, 20 something years ago. And I still remember that, you know, it sticks with you how people talk to you. So um, amplified to someone calling you a terrorist or someone, you know, calling you stupid for, for being passionate and for, for standing up for what you believe is right and you know, honestly, what I believe is right. But, you know, either way, that's not, you know, that's not terrorism, peaceful, 
peaceful activism, you know, talking about issues is not terrorism. And as much as you know that that shows off someone else's ignorance in that moment, it still affects you um, to know that people talk to you that way, you know. So in that, you know, Jen and I were talking before and we were thinking, you know, advice to share. And this is definitely for for kids or students, but I, I think for everyone is, I think one of the most important things you can do is surround yourself with people. You know, I know we're, you know, social distancing or whatever, wherever Massachusetts is and that, but, but emotionally, you know, who you talk to, who you surround yourself with, make it people who, who encourage you, who don't, who don't ever make you feel bad about yourself. Um, and there's some action for you to take in that as well. Um, there is, you know, don't compare yourself to other people um, ever because get inspiration from other people, um, learn from other people, but don't, don't waste your time comparing yourself because then you either end up looking down on people or you start to feel insufficient yourself. Um, so own who you are, get inspiration from others, surround yourself with people who are going to call you out on your stuff in a nice loving way, you know, that, that you have that trust with them, um, call them out on their stuff in a nice loving way. Um, but help yourselves be better people, you know, be excited when you're doing good things and, um, keep, keep doing those amazing things. Keep, you know, doing the activism that you, that you believe in, um, do what you can to be safe, but do, you know, keep, keep doing that activism and keep speaking up. Um, don't let the ignorance of other people keep you down. Yeah. I mean, to me, education is liberation. Um, yeah. you know, I met you and I met so many other strong people and, uh, enriched my network because of my education. Um, it shaped who I am today. And I feel like rather than us posting things on Facebook, like our children are stupid, the expectation of them to go to college. And I realize that this is, has a very big socioeconomic opportunity to it, right? It's access issue. Um, but we should be focused on, on getting kids to college or into the trades that they enjoy and their passions, but supporting them developmentally, uh, spiritually, and emotionally. And, and not, I mean, it's affecting me. I can't imagine how it'd be affecting the children and it happened in front of me. Um, yeah. and it happened to know one of these kids and it's just like, Jesus, <sighs> wow. I, I was just shocked. And my, my best advice is just like, keep on literally doing exactly what you are doing continue the conversations uh these children were asking for a mural right something that probably the community would even be funding um, and even that was problematic and div super divisive and had to do with like well are these terrorists what are you talking about we're talking about kids putting artwork on a wall with your permission <laughs> So, so I, that just made no sense to me. And I think the, the point of this show is also for our young followers to see that there are super strong people around them, that sometimes you have to make your own family. Yeah. And uh, you're part, definitely, Jessica, of my family. So thank you so much for being there for me in the beginning. Um, but also teaching me about Lynn and the way and the perspective here uh, and in what you do. You're very inspiring. So that was the, 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 the thought behind having you. Um, what, what role do you think white privilege played in your development? Because um, I think people need to hear it from a very healthy human being, you know, what yeah. it sounds like to just be like, yeah, I, including me, I was afforded opportunities on the island that I'm from that the majority of people I know were not afforded. So that's kind of what owning that privilege sounds and looks like. Yeah, I, it was something that I definitely did not acknowledge, you know, while, while I was growing up. Um, I'm really glad that the conversations are happening now. And I hope you know, people aren't discouraged by, 
by acknowledging their white privilege. You know, I think, I think where I, I see it really, really stand out is in high school, my honors classes, you know, despite how diverse the, the school was, my honors classes were almost entirely white, you know? And so I think, I think that speaks to, to a lot, you know, I don't know where, how we get to that point, you know, you know, there, there's a lot, you know, that goes into that. I'll tell a story. I worked at a public school, not in Lynn, but in Massachusetts, that they had an initiative and the initiative is good, but how they did it, I don't agree with. So they wanted to give students of color opportunities that they didn't necessarily have otherwise. And I think that's an amazing mission, but I want to explain like why I don't agree how they did it. So I was teaching uh, a ninth grade geometry class and there was a young man, sorry, an honors ninth grade geometry class. And there was a young man in that um, he was in special education. I don't remember, it's too long ago for me to remember exactly what the struggles were, but they definitely affected his abilities in math. Um, and he, in eighth grade, had almost failed algebra. He got like a D minus in algebra, but because he was black, they put him in the honors class to give him that opportunity. I love the idea, but this young man was set up for failure. He did not have the math skills and then he was put in honors. And what ended up happening is when he didn't do well, the school then said, see, people of color shouldn't be in honors. You know what I mean? Like, so they ended up feeding their own narrative and they, they convinced themselves. That's why I left that school, but they convinced themselves that they did everything they could. Look, we gave him this opportunity, but it would be like putting, you know, a fifth grader into calculus. If you're not ready for it, it doesn't matter your skin color. It doesn't matter. You know, they, some of the program, like it needs to be done correctly. And I don't, I don't know the right answer because it's, you know, it depends on each school. I know how we're doing in our school, you know, but we, you know, we just treat each student as an individual. We don't compare them to others. There's, you know, each individual, if you could do it, but race, you know, unfortunately, you know, has a part in education and we need to give people opportunities, but we also need to do it correctly and offer supports. He also wasn't offered supports, you know, to stay in that honors track and to do that. And so that could have gone a long way if he was offered additional tutoring um, yeah. or, you know, I guess a lot of other things. So, you know, it was definitely acknowledging, you know, my, my own privilege in different situations and realizing how that plays out. Cause I'm not sure you, you don't always realize it in the moment, you know, you realize it later, like how would that have been different? You know, I don't know, you know, like I alluded to before, I, I definitely started, ex, you know, experimenting with risky behavior in middle school and high school. And if I had not been white, you know, how would that have played out? Would I have still been in my honors classes? Would I have still been afforded the opportunities that I had, you know, would they have still sent me to the guidance counselor, um, to talk about um, how I was feeling or would I have been written off? Um, you know, I, I'll, I don't know, you know, we'll never know the answers to that, but um, I, I definitely, you know, there's definitely luck involved in anyone's success, um, but there's also, you know, privilege in, in that setting. And I definitely acknowledge that. And um, I hope to be able to offer opportunities to anyone with or without, without that privilege. Thank you for saying it like that. I, according to the like U.S. Census Bureau, see, over sixty-eight percent of Lynn is folks of color, and so you know when the school system is completely set up in that way, uh, and it has a, uh, an overwhelming majority of students of color, where do you think today gaps would happen in Lynn? Um, and that's a tough question to answer because I, you know, it's yeah, there's a lot I'm trying to figure yeah. out where the issue, where the disconnect is. And right. I wonder if it's a difference in what teachers look like versus what the kids look like. And, and right. What, and that's what I was thinking. Feel, well, how does it feel to look at a face that is similar? Or sounds like you and sounds like your home, right? Yeah, it makes me think so. So Jen and I met um, at Northeastern University and, you know, I was an education minor. 
I was an education minor there, but one thing I love about Northeastern, but it's also interesting is that the education program focuses on urban education. Like that's, it's not that you choose that. That is just what the education um, department focuses on. Mm -hmm. And I think that is when I started to really understand, I shouldn't say it should, like I absolutely, that's when I started to understand my white privilege because that they had us reading about white privilege and they had all that. And then the moment then you start looking around and you realize the entire, everyone in your education class is white. Um, and I would say that that's, I don't know the statistics of Northeastern, but I would say the, the percentage of students at Northeastern is also primarily white. So like that, there's a lot that we could talk about there too. But, right. you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't know how we change that. I mean, it's first, right, to become a teacher, you need to pursue higher education. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know how we convince it's a cycle, right? If you don't see people that represent you in that job, it, it makes it harder. I mean, I, I just think about women too, right? I was told that I couldn't be a mathematician because I was a woman, but I, you know, we won't focus on that. It's just, you know, but Exactly. You can go two different ways. You can say, oh, you know, people like me don't go into this profession. So screw that. I'm going to do it anyways. Um, but you have to be ready to hit the obstacles and that, you know, that's and to be discouraged and have people tell you, you know, I've, I've taught people and they're like, yeah, and women really aren't that good at math. Right. I'm like, I'm literally your math teacher. You know, like that, that is literally what I'm doing. Like, I don't understand, you know, like, where's the disconnect? You have hired me to help your child with math, you know, and so it's, it's, you know, picking your moments to have that conversation. I didn't have the conversation with that family in that exact moment because it would have been a reaction and it would have come out of anger and stress. Um, but I waited and had it later, you know, so have those conversations, but there are that's a, a quick pause. A quick pause. Yeah. So that's a great example of what intersectionality can look like. Um, right. It's not necessarily an oppression coming from one side, but it could be from another. And we have different reasons why we can all be systemically oppressed, um, yeah. either as being a student and having people over you in a position of authority and power, but also being a teacher and having to respond to like local government and you and, and not unions, but um, but, you know, federally mandated new things that you must do and change that completely disrupt. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And like I said, I now work at a private school and I mean, we can go right now, especially virtual. I don't, are Massachusetts schools in person right now? They are, right? Uh, there are mixes of in-person right. couple days and then the rest um, at home. But the majority, my understanding is that it's at home. Yeah. So I'm in Los Angeles County. So we're still a hundred percent virtual um, and we will be for a bit. Um, but I, I respect public school teachers. I'm not in private school because I don't respect public school. I do. It just didn't fit my strengths and I was not successful in that. Just like a lot of students are not successful in that. Um, and I had the ability to go somewhere else and still um, meet the mission that I, that I'm trying to achieve of helping students be their best selves, take care of themselves um, and pursue what they you know should be doing after high school, whether that's college or something else. Um, but to empower students is, is really my goal. Um, I, I don't think enough people realize that education, specifically public, but education is one of the few professions that every four or eight years, whether you agree with the president or not, every four or eight years, someone else tells you how to do your job differently. And again, sometimes great things come out of that, you know, like sometimes it does, but I mean, you know, you're a professional and every four to eight years, they're telling you totally different things. I mean, I was in middle school when No Child Left Behind, you know, was enacted. And, you know, that, <laughs> that made more students be left behind, in my opinion. You know, it, it focused on testing and, you know, there's a test is not the measure of what a person knows or doesn't. Um, and... It, it fought initiatives and it didn't consider learning differences enough and anxiety enough that goes into testing. You know, there's a lot of components for this and it didn't, it didn't 
better education. It just put measurements on things. And, and now we have, you know, common core. And I know there's a lot of feelings about that. And that's not necessarily a political move. Um, that's an education move, but I think there's a lack of understanding and a lack of preparing teachers for it. It's just, here's a new thing to do, figure it out. And that's a really, you know, a really tough thing to do, you know, as a teacher to constantly being told how to do things differently and not have the proper um, preparation for it, even if it is a good thing, you know, not having the proper preparation for it. Um, and resources and being resources. We fund it, but continuing to go to work and doing what we have to do. And there's, you know, and there's amazing teachers, you know, it's not to say that teachers can't do things on the resources, but um, I believe wholeheartedly, you know, that every person is an individual. Their needs are different. How they learn is different. How they process is different. And I don't mean just learning in a, in a classroom, mm -hmm. learning anything, right? We all learn every day and how we learn is differently. And so to have a new initiative and say, hey, in two months, you're going to have to do things totally different and maybe having a staff meeting or a professional development day. And that's it. You know, that's not how pe most people learn. They can't just have one day of training and then they can totally change everything that they were doing. You know, it's, but, but public schools are stuck too. You know, if a federal mandate tells you you have to do something or you're going to lose funding, you know, the limited funding you already have, you know, what position are you in? So I don't, I don't envy, um, I don't envy that system. And um, but I, I have a great deal of respect for teachers um, who are in the public school system. Exactly. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me. I know it was, um, you know, we don't know at first what's going to happen, but thank you so much for talking about this, even from a macro level, you know, we're, we're all feeling it. <laughs> so thank you so much for not being scared to go there essentially oh, yeah absolutely um you had asked me before if i if i had advice and i know we leaned into it i think there's there's one more piece of advice i'd love to give um students out there so i already talked about like finding you know surrounding yourself with the right people and do all that but i think an important component to taking care of yourself and taking care of other people especially in the times we're in right now but anytime is don't, don't keep score. Don't keep score with the people that you love. You know, don't say I've been there for you 10 times. You've only been there for me once. Um, that's not helpful. Be clear about your needs with people. Let them know if you need more support or if you feel like you're being used, but don't, don't keep score and say, I'm not going to help anyone out too many times because they might need you right now, but you might need them later. I think just being there for other human beings is what we need to do. I can't believe you just said that because I just had that conversation with a friend of mine in Lynn and we were, we were both feeling that way. It's like, what if we just give up? Because it's just, it's a lot. And then to be harassed about it, it's like, yeah. well, not only are we doing a whole lot, but it's just like, wow. You know, and, and, and I think it's also good to air that those feelings and that frustration out. Thank you so much for bringing that in. My goodness, even be even better. Uh, yeah, don't keep it. Yeah, don't keep it in. You know, say to someone, you know, I I feel like I'm always there for you, um, but you're not there for me. You know, feel like if you if you feel comfortable with someone, someone you trust and you love, you can say that. You can say um, you're never around when I when I need you. You know, if that's if that's how you're feeling, um, and maybe they never realize that. You know, like that. That's how you promote relationships is not with resentment and not with that. Um, I think the other thing talking about the, the leaders who are out there is that just a reminder, you know, you can influence other people, but you can't change other people. You know, you can't change their mindset on you. Um, like specifically you can, but you can change your actions if that's what you want to do. You can have a discussion with them, but chances are yelling at them is not, is not going to help, you know? So just make your, you know, keep doing what you believe is true and your actions will speak a lot louder than words. Amazing. If anyone has any questions, you can reach us at getaeonhelp, G-E-T-A-E-O-N-H-E-L-P at gmail.com. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.